So thanks everyone for being here today. Um, we're going to talk about um, partial least squared. Here's a quick overview for what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about um, multivariate data analysis in general, uh, just to get everyone kind of up to speed about why we might use it, when we might use it, and then we'll get more into the regression modeling and a couple of quick summary slides as well. Um, so, you know, traditionally in science world, I'm sure a lot of you remember the old approach was uh, very univariate. You held uh, all your variables the same except for one, and you change that one variable and see how things um, happened. And then you would hold that one the same and change a different one. Um, and there's a lot of problems with that method. Um, it does give you some information, um, but it's really limited, um, especially if you have a ton of different variables that you're looking at, and if there's any sort of cross-correlation between things. So let's say you have a um, situation where you have three knobs, um, and so you adjust knob A until you get the best results, and then you adjust knob B until you get the best results, etc. cetera. Um, so the ordering that you twist those knobs might give you a different uh, final result that is better or worse than others. So if you approach it more as like changing all the knobs at the same time, you tend to get a better answer and more, more complete understanding of what's going on. Um, so around 1975 is when they came up with some multivariate methods, um, also called chemometrics, when it's applied to chemistry problems. Um, in this particular case, you have very cheap measurements, um, but the experiments are very expensive because you've got a lot of variables that you're changing at a time, um, or you've got a lot of um, wavelengths if you're doing spectral data. Um, so once we got into the Fourier transform systems away from the dispersive elements, instead of having only like 20 or 30 variables, we've now got hundreds or even thousands of uh, wavelengths that we're looking at. Um, so they had to come up with uh, methods that could handle that kind of data. And if you really think about it, um, lots of real world processes are multivariate. One example would be the weather. Um, you've got, there's a lot of factors to the weather, right? You've got wind, you've got air pressure, your temperature. Um, if you only went based on one of those things, say the temperature, then you'd have no idea whether you needed your uh, rain boots for that day, for example. So all of these factors work together to give you a full picture of what the weather is going to be like. And there's lots of different sensors um, to measure these different things. And they're on very different um, ranges. So that's another reason why we use some multivariate mathematics and chemometrics. Um, so if we look at the univariate world, I'm sure anyone who's worked in the process is has seen these types of control charts where you're looking at an individual uh, variable and making sure that it's in normal working conditions. So in this case, we've got temperature and pH. Everything looks hunky-dory, um, but it turns out, um, you know, in the end, there's a result that comes out and something um, – the quality was not accurate or it wasn't good. And you go back and you're trying to do your root cause analysis and you say, hey, all of my specs were fine. There's nothing wrong. It's just a fluke. But we all know there's always some reason for the quality to be different. So if we plot these against each other, because pH and temperature have uh, a relationship between them, we can see quite clearly um, that there is an outlier here that doesn't fit into the space. And you can see in the original control charts, it's very much in this correct space. But if we look at our multivariate view, we can see that there's uh, it clearly stands out. Um, and if we use our original limits, we don't see it. But if we use a multivariate limit, then you can see it and um, flag it right away. So you can go and say, uh, check on it and see what's going on. 
Um, so sometimes what we want to do is some indirect observations. Um, for example, if you wanted to measure the temperature in a furnace, um, there aren't really any thermometers that will allow you to measure that directly because they'll all explode. So what we can do is use a IR emission spectrometer, look at the light coming off of it, and depending on the shape of the output, we can figure out what the temperature actually is in that particular case. And these types of indirect measurements often need a multivariate approach. So types of multivariate data. Um, there's a wide range of industries and types of data that you can look at using multivariate analyses, um, one of which would be sensory data. So if you're trying to compare a, a panel and some uh, chemical reactions, you can look at consumer preference um, because you often have very many different things that you're looking at and you want to find like a sweet spot for things. Um, also, you've got spectral and image data. Uh, specifically, near-infrared is very common to use multivariate analysis due to the combination and overtone bands that you see. And we can also look at chemical data. So you might do some raw material analysis or process variables, um, compare that um, and connect that with your end product quality measurements. Um, so there's a lot, a wide range of uh, types of data you can look at. And so it's very commonly used in spectroscopic data, as I said. Um, these uh, can provide both uh, chemical information, uh, composition type information, as well as physical characteristics that are specific to the samples. And um, because you've got so many wavelengths that you're looking at, um, it's highly multivariate, just by definition, and requires some really good visual and analytical tools to pull out the important information and remove the noise in your particular situation. Um, so data analysis and process practice, um, we like to say it's really 70% uh, is based on your application knowledge. You are the subject matter, matter expert and your common sense. Um, this is really important when you go into a problem that you understand what you're looking at and what you're trying to answer. The remaining 30% is your statistics and your mathematics, and that's the part that the unscrambler takes care of for you. Um, but you do need to apply your application knowledge and common sense when you're interpreting the output. Um, there's different interpretations depending on different industries or the type of information that you're looking to get out of your analysis. So let's go into regression modeling. What is a regression model? So if we have a problem here, so we've got these um, samples that we want to know the weight of, but we don't actually have a scale. Um, so you might come up with some other way to figure out what the weight is. For example, we know based on our first principles that the expansion of a spring is directly related to the weight that's placed on it. So what we would do is come in, have some standard weights, some masses that we are confident in, and measure the expansion of the spring. By doing that, we get a bunch of masses, a bunch of lengths, and we can fit a line to that and come up with an equation that then allows us to back calculate our unknown. Um, do note that this value is in between uh, the the range that we have calibrated to. That's very important um, that you're Regression is only as good as the data that you put into it. It's only good for that range. Um, if you got a prediction of 4.5, you can't necessarily trust that information. So just keep that in mind. So if we collect data and we think that there's some relationship, we often plot those variables together. And we hope that there is a linear relationship between those variables. Um, so then to model that relationship, we use least squares to obtain the predictive model. And then this model can then be used to estimate future values for new samples. How do we do that? Again, this is just a visual of this. So we plot X and Y together, fit a straight line 
and used our matrix algebra to determine the model parameters. So you've got your intercept term and your slope of the line and then this error. And the error is the distance of these individual points away from that. Now in traditional regression models, we often just ignore this error. We don't talk about it very much, but that's a very important um, statistic when we're looking at uh, multivariate regression models. So another type of regression is just an extension of that simple univariate measurement uh, regression. So instead of having just um, one way of measuring, one type of X, um, what we do is we have multiple X's and you get a slope for each one of those. So the response is related to multiple different inputs. This is fine when your number of variables is very small um, and if there's no correlation between the variables. If there are correlations between the variables it becomes unstable and the, the equation is not um, efficient at that point. And part of the problem here with this type of approach is that there's very few diagnostics associated with this when you compare to some of the next methods I'm talk going to talk about. Um, so principal component regression, it overcomes this line collinearity problem by looking at the uncorrelated variables with each other. So what you do is you do a principal component analysis on your data and then you try to fit your line through that. Um, so basically you do a PCA, then apply your MLR, it's the exact example, and you get your Y output. Um, most common though is going to be your partial least squared regression. Uh, this is kind of the workhorse of the multivariate regression models. Um, same thing, you start off with principal components analysis, so you fit those and you get your scores. And you also do a PCA of your Y block data. Um, this allows you also to have more than one Y output, so you might measure um, in a pharmaceutical experiment on your tablet, you might measure the amount of lubricant in there as well as the amount of the active drug ingredients, um, as well as a particular uh, degradation um, known product. Um, so you can do that all at once when you use uh, PLS methods. So you get the scores from both of those principal components analysis, you plot them against each other, and then there's a linear fit between those. Um, and so it's aiming to maximize this covariance between X and Y. So it's basically finding the maximum variance in X that relates to the maximum variation in Y. And we'll show some examples in a minute and you'll understand that a little bit more clearly. So some of the statistics we care about when we're looking at PLS, um, the kind of the major one um, that we start with is this root mean square error. Um, they have slightly different um, anagrams um, based on the stage at which you're predicting them. Um, so you've got an error for calibration, you've got an error for prediction, and an error for cross-validation. Um, we'll keep in mind that these errors are reported in the same units as your Y outputs. So it's a direct relationship there. It tells you um, that error, so how far across the entire range um, those individual points or the group of points is away from that line. The bias is going to tell you if there's um, a systematic positive or negative deviation from the points or more of the points above the line or more of them below the line. Um, you really want a bias of zero that says that you are um, predicting a little bit high and a little bit low for everything rather than everything a little bit high. Um, again, this is not the same as the intercept. The intercept is where your line crosses zero on the uh, x-axis, um, but the bias here is talking about that shift of points above or below the regression line. Um, the other thing we might look at is slope. Um, what we're going to look at is a predicted versus reference plot, so what the model says the answer is versus what you've told the model the answer is, um, and you would like a slope of one. That's kind of the, the ultimate holy grail in that case. So this is what it looks like in the unscrambler. 
um, you get a predicted versus reference plot, and these are our errors. So the blue line here is that calibration. That's just going to be using all of your data. And then your red ones are from your cross-validation. So that's going to be your um, best guess at what your model is going to look like when there's new data presented to it. We also look at our R squared value. That's a measure of how much variance is captured by um, the particular number of factors. Um, so there's two kind of R squared values. There's the Pearson R squared and the R squared. Um, if you look at those, the closer they are to each other, the more reliable the model is, um, as long as you're not using a gazillion factors. Um, keep in mind when you're trying to build a model, you want to use as few factors as possible to prevent from um, modeling noise. And we'll talk about that more later. Um, this is just a little bit more on your regression terminology. It does give you your, um, your abbreviations that have slightly different meanings depending on which stage of your, um, your calibration or prediction you're in, your model building. So let's go to an example. I have an example here for some paper. So this is process data. We're looking at a bunch of different uh, types of paper and we've got some measurements for them. So we've got weight, the type of ink used, the brightness, the scatter, lots of interesting things. And what we want to do is know what the print through is going to be like. Um, so the print through is how much your ink leaks through your paper. Um, we want to minimize that. So first thing we want to do is <clears throat> I want to take a look at my different variables. You can see pretty quickly um, looking at the spreadsheet that a lot of these are in different scales. So we've got things like filler that's ranging from about one to four. Other things like density are in the 600s, 700s. So if we look at these directly um, in our model, what's going to happen is just because these numbers happen to be big, they're going to bias the data um, or the model to, to say that they're more important than they may, may be. So one thing, if we don't, can't see it very uh, directly here, is under tasks, we can do a descriptive statistics. And I'm going to do on my process data. Now what this does is it shows me my box plots for my data. What these are is it shows the median value, the maximum, the minimum, and then your quartiles. This is the 25th quartile to the 75% quartile. So most of the data falls inside the box, um, and then the rest of it is out here. And what we can see is that the density up here is a really high value. They're pretty tight values um, compared to something like scatter or ink, which has a very low value. So you can see here again, this is just a nice visual to show you that you need to do some sort of pre-processing. And what we're going to do in this case is we're going to divide by the mean to get these down on the same scale and then or subtract the mean and then divide by the standard deviation. So that means that something, these two, they both have very high values. This one has a lot more variation because the box is bigger, the whiskers are wider. Um, so we want to make sure that they're on the same um, starting scale. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my data matrix. I'm just going to do tasks, analyze, uh, partially squared regression. I'm going to use my process values and predict my quality output. So often when we are building um, calibration models, if you have enough data, we actually split it up into a training and a test set. Uh, this is the best approach um, for understanding what's going to happen later when you do new data. We want to go into our X weights. This is where we're going to apply our mean and standard deviation scaling. So I'm going to select this 
select all of those, and then update. Make sure you hit this update. You'll know if the weighting is applied because it will show up here in that weighting value. And I'm just going to be weighting this again. There we go. And then we say OK. Now the first thing we want to look at is this explained variance chart. Um, what this is, it's going to tell us in my first factor how much of the Y variance is captured. And we can see here that this should be a two-factor model. So you can see that after two factors, you don't gain any more information by adding more factors. And you want to use as few factors as possible. That gives you your error that you are accepting. Um, keep in mind that you want to know before you go into these analyses what error is okay um, for you. I get asked often, um, is this a good model? And I have to put it back to someone and say, well, what error are you willing to accept? What's reasonable for what you're looking at? And remember that error cannot be any better than your reference method. In the case with the um, expanding spring, if we're using a yardstick, that's broken down into inches, you're going to have a, your error is going to be plus or minus um, half an inch or so, where if you're using a 12 inch ruler that's divided into um, sixteenths of an inch, then your error is much tighter based on that. So just keep that in mind uh, when you're going forward. The numbers may come out smaller, but know that that just means that um, the variation in your variables is less than your measurement. So your error is actually no better than what the standard laboratory error is. So we go back and make sure, okay, we want factor two. And if we look at our predicted versus reference, we can see that the unscrambler did choose two factors for you. Um, Sometimes uh, it will choose a three factor with something that looks a little bit like this. And you know from your own personal experience um, that you want to bring it back to two. So just keep in mind that um, this is a guideline. It's not a strict, um, the software told me to use it. That's therefore I'm using it. You have to use your own judgment as well. Um, so the next thing we look at is our scores. Uh, what we want to see is a nice um, even spread of the scores, which we do see here. Um, one thing that we can do in here that's kind of nice is we can right click, do a sample grouping, clear that, and we can color these based on that quality just to see if we can see some patterns. And sure enough, we can see patterns um, that it starts with the um, the lower print through going to the higher print through. And again, we want to minimize, so you're probably going to want to be down in this area. Um, if you have different categories, um, you might see some groupings in there as well, but you just want to see this nice kind of even spread over your whole space. One thing that we can put on is our hoteling T-squared ellipse. Um, this is set at a 95% confidence interval, so in a normal situation, 95% of your data should fall within this circle. And as you see, we have a couple of uh, stragglers that are out here, but that's still very normal. Um, if something was way out here, then you might flag it as being an outlier, but this is a pretty normal case. Another thing we want to look at is our loadings. This tells us which individual original variables are the most important. So I'm going to put my labels on. And I like to do this correlation loadings. Um, this kind of puts everything on the same scale on the unit circle, so you can tell a little bit more about things. Um, in general, things that are between the two ellipses are important variables, and those that are towards the center are not that important. Um, we want to keep in mind that anything that's very close together are correlated. That means that as PPS increases, so does the roughness. Um, permeability is fairly correlated with those as well. Um, so sometimes this will help you identify when you can remove variables. Let's say, for example, that PPS is very expensive or difficult to measure. Um, if roughness 
is highly correlated with that, then it means that likely you can remove that measurement. Um, and this gives you a justification for doing that. We can see the print throughs over here. It's mostly described by um, principle or factor one. Um, how we interpret that is here, factor one, it takes 18% of our X variance to explain 81% of our Y variance. And then factor two is another 16% of our X variance describes another 6% of our Y variance. So with two factors, we're explaining 87% of our um, Y variability, which is pretty good. Um, Okay, and we can see that things that are opposite from each other are anti-correlated. So your opacity and your scatter and maybe your weight are anti-correlated with your print through. So that means as your opacity increases, your print through decreases, which makes sense. Um, keep in mind that you should be able to interpret these loadings. They should make sense. Um, if it doesn't you know, intuitively makes sense from the beginning, you might want to dig in a little bit and try to think about why things are showing up the way they are. Um, but if we go back to this 18% of the X is describing 81% of my Y, that's kind of suggesting to me that I may not need all of those variables to explain my Y. Um, so you might come in and you could highlight these in the middle. I'm just going to take the ones very close on the inside here. We can circle them, I can click them one by one. And now what I'm going to do is right click on my PLS and say recalculate without the marked variables. Just say okay. And we get the pretty much the same thing. So we've got um, two factor model again, that's explaining a little bit less of our my variance, but that's okay. The RMSCE didn't change very much. If we go back and look at this one, um, we have an error of 3.3. Again, that's in print through units. Um, and we're going to 3.5. Um, so you didn't lose too much in removing those variables and it gives you a little bit more robust model. Um, the fewer things you can have in the that you can get away with in the model, the more robust it is, the less likely it's going to um, be affected by any noise that happens in there. So again, let's look at this printed versus reference here. Um, if we go to the top, we can put in what our regression lines looks like, um, as well as the target line. So the target line, the black one is a one-to-one. -one. So if this was a perfect correlation, this would line up directly. Um, and the thing we really care about here is our RMSE. Is the error okay? Um, once we know that our error is okay, we kind of look at our R squared. Um, we've got 82% uh, 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 R squared, which is really good. Um, it, depending on your industry, uh, these things will be a little bit more determined for you. In pharmaceuticals, you often need... Um, you often need uh, uh, over 90, or like 85 or 90 um, on these R squares. Um, but again, that's all regulatory stuff and things that you need to know. Uh, that's your common sense and application. So I'm getting a question of why these two factors are poor at explaining X blocks. So in this case, um, we're not really trying to explain the X blocks. We're trying to explain the Y output. Um, so that's, it's saying that we're using 34% of the X to explain the majority of the Y. Um, if we were doing a P principal components analysis, then we would care more about, um, how much of the X block is using. It's basically telling us that not everything in here is important to predict Y. So maybe this filler, um, we can actually go in here. If I look at my explain variance, if I click on X, that shows me what, how much X is being explained by each factor. And I should be able to, yes, if I do X or Y, it gets a little bit messy, but you can start to see it with individual um, 
let me put the legend on, the individual variables. So it's going to say, okay, so this filler quality is not explained very well um, at all until you maybe you get up to factor seven. Um, we can go through and see which ones are being explained by the best by those two factors, and we can compare them to the overall. So roughness is explained very well by two components. And opacity is really a one component. It's only playing into the first principle or first factor there. So that's how you can kind of look at that. And it helps you sort of determine which variables are worth looking at further or not. Okay, let's go back to my slides. So interpreting a model, right? So like I said, the first thing you want to look at is the number of components to take into account. Um, you can look at that RMSE or the explained variance plot. We can also look at a press plot, which looks at our error. Let me pull that one up for you as well. If I right click in here, PLS, and I'm going to look at the RMSE. So I'm looking for where there's um, a major drop and then sort of a plateau. Um, so definitely no more than two factors. Um, we can crunch this back if at the top here. If I use this arrow, I can see what it would look like for a just a one factor model. If this error is good enough for you, stop at that one factor model. Um, you, again, you want to use as few factors as is necessary. And that's sort of how you start um, looking at choosing them. This is sort of your starting point. And then there's other ways that we talk about in the advanced uh, PLS webinar. All right. So we look at the number of components. Um, then we look at your scores um, just to see how your data is distributed. You look for any patterns, any groupings um, to see if there's similarities or differences in those data. Then we look at our loadings so that we can understand what we're actually um, describing. What's the correlation between those uh, independent variables and the response variables? Which X variables are best um, describing the Y? Number four is when we finally look at the predicted versus reference. Um, many people try to start there. Uh, that's not the best thing. Again, if you go in and let's say the unscrambler chose seven factors to look at and you get, oh, I have this beautiful predicted versus reference. Um, but you go back and you look um, at your explained variance and you see, oh, I really only want about two factors. So you need to make sure to take these three steps first before you really look at that um, part. And then your B coefficients, um, that's going to be actually your regression coefficients. If you want to correlate them back to a traditional linear regression model, that's going to be basically your, your slopes for each individual thing. Um, I was asked a question with the uh, principal components analysis. It is, it is known to be better to use at least two PCs. With factors you mentioned, if you can explain well with one, that is enough. Um, so I don't know where you got that about the two, at least two PCs. It really depends on your data. Um, Sometimes just for visuals, when you're doing a principal component analysis, using two factors is nice, um, but sometimes, or principal components, but sometimes one explains, say, 99% of your variability. Um, you need to go back and look and see why that is. Um, but yeah, sometimes factors, one factor is enough to explain. You really have to determine that based on your error rate that you're willing to accept. Okay, so we look at the number of components. If we look at our explained variance curve, that's the default. Um, you find where there's a local plateau, where these are evening off, evening off. You're not getting any more information by adding more factors. Um, you're also looking for that red line, the, the validation variance. If it starts to die, diverge away from your calibration variance, it's telling you that it doesn't predict well. So you wouldn't want to take any more than whatever is right. Oop, let me go back. 
right around here. Once it starts to divert away, stop. At that point, you're over modeling and you're getting into noise. So this is another um, example of that. If you use too few components, then you don't actually explain enough of your data and you get poor prediction. Um, if you use too many, then you're going to start um, having error in your estimation. So you want to find this nice, happy medium point. Um, again, it's going to be very dependent on your application. Um, but minimizing things is better. We look at our scores plot um, to see how the samples are distributed. Um, in this case, everything's well distributed here, but we're looking at um, different feeds, I believe, in this particular case. And we can see that things that are fed salmon, um, they kind of group together. Um, so that can give you some other information that's not uh, directly related to why, for example. Um, you might have patterns in your data. And these ellipses are just showing the general groups. They are not statistically sound. They are just drawn on there, um, just so you know. Um, we're looking at our correlation loadings. I showed you this. So your red value is what was your Y block, what you're trying to explain. Um, and then the blue ones here are the uh, X variables that you put in there. And so it helps you understand what's going on here. This um, EPA variable is strongly correlated with the diet of salmon. Okay. Sex and BMI are two very correlated variables, um, but they are anti-correlated with your EPA. Ah, I have someone asking about how to determine correlation loadings in the case of data from a spectrometer. I will get that into get to that in my second example, so just bear with me. Um, so we looked at our predicted and reference plots. Um, like I said, the thing that I look at first is this error. Um, if the error is not acceptable, then it doesn't matter what any of the other numbers are. Um, once you've got an error that you're happy with, then you start taking into account things like your R squared, um, you know, what your slope is. You want that to be as close to one as possible. Um, and that's really about it. You might want to check about the bias as well. If things are consistently over predicting or under predicting, that's good to know. Um, but it tends to be around um, around closer to zero. So um, the bias usually doesn't fall into most applications that I've run into. Um, this is how we measure the error. Um, it's based on our residuals, so we know what our actual Y value is when we're building our method or our model. And then we know this Y hat is what the model is predicting. So it takes what we know the value is, subtracts the predicted value, and then to keep things a little bit neater, we square it. So that gets rid of the signs. And then we sum that up over every single data point and then we divide it by n. Okay, that's your variance um, over all of your y values. To get the error, you take the square root of that. Um, if anyone's taken much statistics, you see this formula looks very similar to your standard deviation, um, and it is related to that um, just by the mathematics. But yeah, so this RMSEP, that's the error of prediction. Uh, the only thing that's different when you have the standard error of calibration or cross-validation is that this uh, denominator changes a little bit differently because you have some degrees of freedoms that are issues. So in the calibration, it's like N minus K, which is the number of factors, minus one. And the cross-validation is N minus one, just to be a little bit more robust. Um, so again, we look at our B coefficients. Um, we have something called an uncertainty test that provides an automatic detection of significant variables. Um, I have a, a formula for that in the next slide. Um, this does require cross-validation, and it will automatically mark your variables in the plots. And I'll show you that in the next one.
or I'll rerun this, the uh, paper one to show that to you. Um, then the uncertainty test helps draw conclusions on how robust the model is, the importance of variables, um, and so on. So it looks at you know what your regression coefficient is for the main model, um, minus what that regression coefficient would be for your individual submodel. So that's for the cross validation. Um, so it's looking at the error in the actual regression coefficients um, through all the models. And that gives you a general idea of how um, how much this value changes as you're doing your cross validation. Um, I'm going to skip these slides. Let me go back here and show you real quick how to do the uncertainty test. If we do analyze partially square regression training, make sure I get everything just right. On the validation screen, there's here for uncertainty test. Okay, and now what happens is you see that it marks some of my variables. It tells me which ones are the most important here. Um, so we can look at our correlations loadings. Okay, and now what we can do is we can go through, go ahead and highlight our Y value if we want to take it at its um, take it for granted that those are correct. Um, we can do recalculate with, uh, with marked variables and we get a slightly more robust model, um, even more likely to be maybe just a one-factor model. Our RMSEs dropped a little bit there as well. Okay, um, one thing we can look at here so that you can see what those look like, PLS, important variables okay so this is showing you what's happening this is how um, intense that uh, regression coefficient is this is how much it changes depending on your the variance um, for each cross section um, if this stays if this variance stays on one side of the zero line then it's considered important if it crosses that zero line that's saying sometimes it's positive as y increases and sometimes it's negative as y increases and so it's not very useful for predicting y um, so that's kind of how you can interpret that as well so in the sake of time, I'm going to go to my spectroscopy example. So this is um, near-infrared data on different types of fuels, and we're trying to measure the amount of octane. Again, tasks, analyze, partially squared. We're going to use our NIR spectra to predict octane. Um, in this case, we don't weight our variables because they're all on the same scale. Um, spectroscopic data, we don't tend to weight unless we know there's, say, a particular region that we want to ignore. Um, everything else remains the same. And I forgot to change this. So... One thing you want to do when you are looking at spectroscopic data is when you've made your row set, we can right click and tell it the software that it is spectra. What that does, you will see very quickly here, is that it defaults to showing our regression coefficients as a bar or a line plot. And in this case of automatically selected the particular ranges that are supposed to be most important for predicting why. I'm going to unmark all those for now, just so we can look at it. First thing we want to look at is our explained variance. We can see um, this is very common when you have some outliers, is that that first uh, cross-validation is really bad, um, but then your next factor pulls back in and everything looks much better once you get to two and three factors and it predicts okay. Um, if I look at my scores, I'm just going to do this quickly, on my sample grouping, 
In this particular case, um, some of my samples have ethanol added to them. And we can see that these two that have ethanol added to them is what is causing that major difference. If I right click over here, I can look at my loadings in a line plot. And we can see that this is, um, you interpret the loadings and the regression coefficients just like you would a, a spectrum. Um, in near IR, uh, OH um, absorbs around 1420. And sure enough, this peak is around 1410. So this is that OH peak. And that's what's separating out these from those. Um, this is another key for outliers that all of your data tends to line up along uh, principal component two instead of principal component one. Um, we can go in, I can select those as outliers, right click, recalculate without the marked samples. It's just gonna remove them, everything else stays the same. And now we have a nice two-factor model. So let me go and answer that question here my loadings line, um, correlation loading. So it looks like this now, it's still red, it's got some bars. Um, and it helps point out which individual wavelengths are really the most important, okay? So it's looking like um, things in this region, which is going to be due to your the amount of saturation um, of your bonds or the branching in your spectrum is going to be related to octane. We know that to be the case. Um, that's kind of what these are. Um, and then I don't remember what exactly is here, but you can go in and, you know, use your knowledge of infrared spectra. Um, I often go back and use a chart uh, to go back and say, okay, what absorbs here? Does that make sense for my sample? Um, things like that. We can look at more than one factor at a time and can see where those important factors are. So you could use that as well to determine um, if we mark these with the rectangle, we can choose ooh, just the things that are in those, in that range. Um, and then in this range, and you can see it's very similar to what it was when we um, had the automatic um, adjustments there. Um, and Let's see, that's that example. Um, so this is one of my major things, is what is a valid model? It depends very greatly on the field you're in. If you're on consumer science, you're studying people, um, you can get away with um, error and R squareds that are much lower um, than you can if you're doing analytical chemistry. Um, process modeling, if you have an R of about 0.8, you're doing really great. Um, again, analytical chemistry, pharmaceuticals, you're looking at above 0.9 often. Um, again, you have to determine this before you go into it, um, what you're going to be willing to accept. Um, this is sort of the workflow for multivariate data analysis. You collect your data. You check your data. Um, we did that with our descriptive statistics, for example. You might plot your data. Um, in the case of uh, spectroscopic data, I always plot my data first. Um, I didn't show you here just because I see we're running out of time. But I would come in here and say, OK, let me just plot my data, see if anything stands out to start with. And I can see that, yes, I've got these that are slightly different and I can see in this particular case it's automatically marked for me these are ones that have that additive in there and it's good to know these things up front before you start doing analyses um, if you had something that was grossly noisy you might say oh something was wrong with that sample I don't even want to include it in my analysis at all so you kind of do a gut check first Excuse me. Um, then we make a model. That's going to be your calibration. 
you check your model, that's going to be validation. We didn't really show that today, but you would take some, um, sometimes just cross-validation is enough. If it's a very difficult um, experiment to run, you might stop with a cross-validation. That's totally valid. It's not okay in the pharmaceutical world. You have to have a separate standalone batch um, or five to uh, to check your model. So that's when you apply your model to data that you know the accurate result for based on your other traditional method and make sure that it's predicting the way you expect it to. And then you apply your model and new samples and you have your statistics to um, validate that to say that um, within this error amount, um, I'm confident in those results. So how to be a good data analyst, um, make sure to use representative calibration and validation data. Uh, make sure that things are evenly distributed. Um, you're going to want to incorporate all the major variations that you can think of. Um, you select appropriate validation method, um, whether it's cross-validation or a test set. You look for outliers. Um, decide whether you want to keep them or remove them. Um, and then choose the optimal number of factors or principal components you want to use. Um, remember not to overfit. Um, you interpret any patterns in that data. Um, sometimes if you have separate subgroups, um, you do better if you actually make a model for each individual subgroup. Um, interpret the variable relationships. Make sure that your loadings make sense. Um, but only once you are sure that you're satisfied with that model, okay? Uh, we didn't talk about transformation or pre-processing, but sometimes the data isn't as um, beautiful as what I show in here, and so you have to do some little pre-processing things. Um, so just make sure that you know what you're doing and why, okay? You check on how it will perform with new data by setting the validation results. Um, and remember that your prediction error depends on the validation method used and the selection of calibration and validation samples. Um, I do have a question about how to choose a good test set. Um, I could give an entire talk on that probably, but the general thing is that you want your test set to span your full range as well. Um, for example, Here, if I had a test set and all, and I had 10 data points that I was testing and they all fell down in this area, that would not be a very good test set because it only validates this, this area. So you want to make sure that it spans the full range. Um, it should almost be, you know, a subset of your calibration set. Um, and it should also um, have all the variation that you're expecting to see. Um, you choose your test set the sign of the same way that you choose your uh, calibration set. I um, hope that's a good enough answer for now. Okay. Um, practice makes perfect, or I would say practice makes better. Um, I've been doing this stuff since 2007, and I still learn new things every day. Um, even in my very basic course that I take, someone asks a question, and it makes me think about things in different ways. So, um, so stick with it. Go back, get to um, working with your data. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. I forgot to put my email on here. Let's see where I can do that real quick just so that you have it. It's just hbrook at camo.com. Make that a little bit bigger for you guys so you can see that. All right. Um, we do not distribute the slides, just so you know, but it is recorded. You can always go back and re-watch it. Um, and if you need some sample data, there are tutorials in the Unscrambler under the help files um, that walk you through um, examples. Hope everyone has a great day.